Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this month's lecture is on neuroradiology and will be presented by Dr. Eric Biondo Seven from Michigan. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Eric. Um, lecture today is uh, going to be on uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, we see a lot of that here in Michigan. Um, but uh, give you a little bit of background on myself. Um, uh, Do obviously uh, my past uh, history. I was a physical therapist. I'm actually still licensed and haven't practiced in a couple years. But I'm um, currently chief of radiology here in Valley Sinai Hospital, uh, where I'm also the assistant radiology resident uh, program director. Um, I'm a clinical professor at both Michigan State and Wayne State Universities and uh, CAQ in neuroradiology. So uh, let's get started here. Um, some of you might know some uh, people with multiple sclerosis. Here are a couple of the uh, most famous people. Uh, some of you may have heard of Annette Funicello. She was an original Mickey Mouse Club member. That's her on the left. Um, Montel Williams is also uh, a person with multiple sclerosis. Uh, Richard Pryor and um, Neil Cavuto, who's on Fox Business. Um, types of multiple sclerosis, there are, there are multiple. <clears throat> Um, let me go into this first. Uh, the most common multiple sclerosis is the most common chronic inflammatory demyelinating, demyelinating disease that affects the central nervous system um, of young adults in Western countries. Um, MS does have a variable course, um, and I'll go through some of those. Uh, one of them is called the clinically isolated syndrome, or CIS, and that uh, represents the majority of the cases, approximately 85%. Um, usually, these patients present with uh, some optic nerve involvement, uh, the brain stem or the spinal cord. Um, another type that you're probably most familiar with is uh, called relapsing remitting. Um, the symptoms uh, evolve over a period of several days. Uh, they stabilize and then they often improve. Uh, another type is called secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. Um, and these patients show persistent signs of CNS uh, dysfunction that may develop after relapse and they may progress between the relapses, which is obviously different than relapsing remitting. Um, another type is called benign multiple sclerosis, which is approximately 10 to 20 percent of patients um, with the aforementioned relapsing multiple sclerosis can be characterized by accumulation of, the, of modest or um, no disability over a long period of time. So they may have um, this multiple sclerosis, but really no, show no disability. Um, another type that 15% of patients uh, have is called primary progressive, and they show a steady progression from the clinical onset without any clear uh, relapses. Um, how do we detect multiple sclerosis? Uh, a lot of times, uh, clinical presentation, the patient goes in to see uh, the primary care physician or even a neurologist. Uh, they may go to the ER um, where the physician may order a CT, um, but that's neither sensitive nor specific. And nine times, 99 times out of 100, actually, it's, it's normal. Um, the study of choice is obviously MR, which is highly sensitive, and it reveals these macroscopic tissue abnormalities. <clears throat> um, what types of techniques do we use for multiple sclerosis and MRI? Um, the conventional MR techniques, we use dual echo, fluid attenuated uh, inversion recovery, better known as flare, um, and also T1-weighted imaging with and without uh, contrast or, or the mainstays of uh, ways that we evaluate MS. Um, dual echo and flare are, the, are very highly sensitive, but they're less specific for MS lesions. Um, what you will normally see with those are focal areas of hyperintensity. Um, I have some images that we'll, you'll see in a little bit. Um, other ways to detect MS, um, edema, inflammation, demyelination, remyelination, gliosis, and axonal loss can have a similar appearance. So even though a patient may, uh, some of these lesions may look like MS, um, it may not, in fact, be MS. Um, we give gadolinium because we're looking to see if it enhances. And what enhancement does, it distinguishes the active from the inactive lesions. Um, and what that tells you is that there's actually permeability of the blood-brain barrier that indicates ongoing inflammation. So that's what an active demyelinating plaque is. It's a breakdown of the uh, blood-brain barrier. Um, there's new research that suggests uh, contrast agents such as magnetism and multihance. Uh, accumulate within the brain. Some of you might have read about this. Um, so contrast agents such as Gadavis that we are currently using where I'm working uh, do not appear to accumulate, but again, time will tell on this. Um, I don't want to waste time and tell you why they think that is, but uh, just know that uh, some places have 
uh, switch the GATA disk. Um, <clears throat> some of you have heard of the term black holes. Um, these are seen on T1 images. They appear dark on the pre and post T1 uh, contrast images. And what these are, these are associated with severe tissue loss uh, with both demyelination and axonal loss. So that's really, when you see black holes, that's, uh, that's advanced multiple sclerosis. And on this axial uh, T1 weighted MRI with someone with MS, you can see that, uh, the big arrow there, it's a black hole. Um, they're just dark, and that's uh, what you're seeing there is axonal loss. So what's the MR imaging criteria for, uh, dis uh, for dissemination in time for multiple sclerosis? So this is the, the definition. You should have at least one clinically asymptomatic T2 hyperintense lesion in at least two of the four characteristic locations, which I'll get to in a minute, and they are required for disease dissemination in space. So where you'll normally see them are, is juxtacortical or subcortical. Periventricular, which um, some of you know is the classic Dawson's fingers um, appearance. Uh, infra infratentorial, which is in the dentate nuclei and in the spinal cord, and the lesions, you know, as you know, um, they they have a length of less than two vertebral bodies. Um, and that's just a big uh, something I, I got up uh, one of my uh, um, lectures uh, talking about um, some of these lesions here, and I won't waste your time with them, but uh, they pretty much say this, the same sort of thing. Um, hold on a second. Get rid of that. Four hours. Postpone. Okay. Uh, clinical non-radiological tests. So how else can we uh, determine if someone has multiple sclerosis? Uh, you can look at the CSF, and you look for oligoclonal bands of IgG, and you'll see that in 90% of the time in patients with MS. Um, however, patients with HIV, Lyme disease, sarcoid, syphilis, um, SSPE, um, or chronic meningitis can have a similar CSF finding. So it's not exactly the, the, the best test to do, but it will, you will see a positive in 90% of people with MS. Um, you can do evoked potentials to measure the speed of the nerve conduction of the brain, and of course, since MS uh, is de demyelination, you'll see a decrease in, in speed, which suggests demyelination, of course. Um, imaging studies, as I've said, CT is not sensitive for MS, um, but in the CT you will see areas that uh, look like low attenuation. Um, MRI can show you new or old areas of demyelination, um, but the one thing is, is lesions, the, the lesions that they have may or may not um, and often do not correlate with clinical symptoms, so that's something you may want to talk with your uh, neurologist or your primary care doctor um, who's ordering the test. Um, so what's the diagnostic criteria for MS? Um, again, as I said, the white matter lesions which are disseminated over time and space. Uh, someone who has clinically definite MS should have two symptomatic episodes and evidence of two white matter lesions, uh, clinical or on imaging, um, in, the, in the locations that I told you before. <clears throat> um, they should have laboratory supported uh, MS. Again, two episodes of symptoms, evidence of one white matter lesion and oligoclonal bands on CSF. Um, if they have probable MS, there are two episodes in either one lesion or oligoclonal band. So there's different reasons, uh, different diagnostic criteria for someone with multiple sclerosis. Um, a typical appearance, uh, which is what we're most in, um, uh, interested in, on the T1-weighted, um, the demyelinated areas are going to be uh, ISO to hypo-intense, again, the black holes. On the T2-weighted image, um, the demyelinating areas are going to be bright, so hyper-intense. Um, the workhorse is the flare sequence. Again, that's much easier to see the abnormal areas. Um, and that's the flare. It's an axial. And as you can see there, they're in a periventricular distribution. Um, on the sagittal, they may look like the, the typical Dawson's fingers. So again, just because this is in a typical location for MS doesn't necessarily make this specific image of uh, this patient with MS. But that's how they normally look. On a T2-weighted, again, uh, similar. You're going to have bright areas uh, periventricularly. Um, juxtacortical, these areas right here, periventricular here and here, tends to be in the atria, um, and they also uh, will see it along the um, uh, optic uh, radiations as well. Um, and this is the same patient, you can see the flare as well here, periventricularly, posteriorly, juxtacortical, frontal lobes. Uh, this uh, patient was given contrast, and you can see areas that were enhancing, again, uh, periventricular, juxtacortical, you can see these lesions, and these are the active areas of demyelination. Um, this is a sagittal flare, and again, this is your typical 
periventricular distribution or Dawson's fingers. Again, just imagine you put your fingers in a glove and that's what they look like. Um, and you can also see them in the uh, juxtacortical uh, locations as well here. So this is a pretty classic picture for someone with MS. Um, post contrast again on a different patient, you can see them. Uh, enhancement, juxtacortical, periventricular locations, very classic for someone with MS. This uh, image uh, you'll see here, um, A is a T2, B is T1, and the C and D images are post contrast, and you can see the arrows on there. Uh, the D on the top uh, right um, in the left uh, hemisphere, you see it doesn't enhance, so that would be more of a, of a, re a remote lesion, a black hole, and these lesions here are enhancing, so these are more active, demyelination, and this is non-active. Again, another axial uh, T2 demonstrating um, lesions that are periventricular and juxtacortical. Right here, you can see these lesions here and here. So what else can look like MS and MRI? Um, differential for hypo-intense T1 signal lesions. You can have nonspecific tissue loss. You can have areas of ischemia or infarction. Uh, edema, I'm sorry, edema or acute hemorrhage, malignancy, or even meningioma can, uh, can sometimes present like this. Now, what's your differential for T2 hyperintense lesions? This, I could go on all day for this, but these are some of, just some of the lesions that can be hyperintense. You can have migraine sequela. You can have normal variants or the Verkau robin spaces, of course, MS. You can have Lyme disease, uh, HIV, uh, PML, neurosarcoid, ADEM, any of the vasculitides, uh, diffuse axonal injury, uh, hypertensive sequela or diabetes, uh, cerebral edema, um, chronic ischemia, uh, I'm sorry, chronic ischemia sequela, SSPE, osmotic demyelination, alcohol abuse, drugs, and even post radiation. So again, just because you have hyperintense T2 does not make it multiple sclerosis. Some of the norm, normal variants you'll see um, in some patients, um, which can make it difficult to evaluate if you have multiple sclerosis, you have terminal areas of uh, myelination tends to remain bright on T2, as you can see here. Sometimes we see that more in children than anything. Uh, normal variants in an aging brain, the unidentified bright objects, which I don't tend to use, but I know a lot of people do. Um, but you see them in 30% uh, you know, of uh, normal elderly. I'll be honest with you, I see them much more than that. Um, you see this area here on the left, which is ischemia, a, a, a chronic ischemic area. But you have also these areas here, which are your dilated uh, Verkau robin spaces. Um, so they can be bright as well. <clears throat> Normal variants, you can have some periventricular hyperintensities of an aging brain, normal. Um, you can have white matter hyperintensities for sequela of um, uh, chronic ischemia. Um, so you really have to look for areas that are typical for multiple sclerosis. And again, the most typical is periventricular. And again, it's for Dawson fingers. Um, if you're um, where you're working, where you're doing a residency, does not use a sagittal flare, you should really talk to your program director. Um, or the powers that be about doing a sagittal flare because that really helps me tremendously if I'm if I'm on the fence. Uh, typical locations, like I said, are these Dawson fingers, periventricular, and what they are it's this lymphocytic infiltration um, of, uh, of of multiple sclerosis along the periventricular medullary veins. Um, you see them in the corpus callosum. You see them along the visual pathways posteriorly. Um, again, posterior fossa, particularly the dentate nucleus, doesn't necessarily have to just be there, but that's pretty typical. Um, and again, in the cervical spine, but obviously you can also have it in the thoracic spine as well. Um, the gadolinium enhanced MR, um, again, why do you do it? Uh, you're looking for the active MS plaque. Um, again, just to remind you, it's the uh, breakdown of the blood-brain barrier. Um, and these new and old lesions can be distinguished on MRI this way. Um, you can also have old lesions that actually do become reactive. I've seen a number of those cases. Um, stable number in morphology, but um, some of these lesions can, can reactivate. So it, it has been known to happen. So you look at the brain, you don't see anything, and uh, your ordering physician still thinks it's MS. So what you're going to do next is you're going to look at the spinal cord. Um, what you're going to do typically is a dual echo or spin echo, uh, which is highly sensitive to depict the abnormalities. Um, the lesions are more typical in the peripheral cervical white matter. Remember that uh, the lesions are limited to two vertebral body lengths or less. 
and they tend to occupy less than half the cross-sectional area in the cord. Um, the trick with this is they typically are not T1 hypo-intense, um, you know, like your black holes up in your brain. So um, that's something to keep in mind. Um, STIR we use that uh, quite often as well. Um, uh, STIR is short inversion time, uh, inversion recovery. Um, uh, it can be obtained, but sometimes you get this, uh, you get these flow-related artifacts, which can uh, limit uh, evaluation. So be careful with the use stir. Um, sometimes you see cord atrophy, and what does that tell you? It's uh, it'll tell you that it's more progressive form of multiple sclerosis, um, sort of a, sort of a chronic uh, multiple sclerosis. So this is a sagittal, um, more of a stir uh, image here, and you'll see uh, labeled C2, 3, uh, C4, and C7, and it tends to be more in the um, the C2 and 3 and C7 are more along the um, dorsal cord, and the C7 is more uh, uh, ventral. Um, that's, that's how they tend to look. Uh, sometimes the patient's moving, so it's a little difficult to see them. Um, I tend to really uh, correlate that on an axial. On the sagittal C2, uh, do you notice the hyperintense uh, signal on the dorsal cord? Um, you can see it here. You can see it here. Uh, C3, 4, C5, 6. Those, those are multiple sclerotic plaques. Dr. Bianca's having? Answers here. Yes. I'm having a little trouble hearing you every once in a while. Okay. Could you yeah. maybe speak a little louder, please? You got it. No problem. Thank you so um, much. You're welcome. Uh, so the sagittal T1 post contrast, you notice the area of enhancement in the dorsal cord there at C7 with the big arrow on it. Just going to keep the one start. Hold on a second. Um, so that's, that's an area of uh, active demyelination. Uh, sometimes what they'll want to do is uh, look at the optic nerves because the patient's having issues with their, with their vision. Um, again, it's not usually required, and we don't do it unless there are symptoms. What are you going to see in somebody who has um, involved in other, uh, the optic nerves? You're going to see a dilation of the optic nerve sheath, uh, usually posterior to the globe, and you may or may not have uh, optic nerve sheath enhancement. <clears throat> uh, on this case on the right, uh, it's a thin section axial T1 uh, post contrast, and you'll see enhancement along that optic nerve. Um, I've seen this is pretty classic, um, but I ha haven't seen too many classic uh, images like this. Sometimes they're very, very faint. This is a coronal. You'll see this obvious enhancement and enlargement of the right optic nerve. Okay, so that correlated with the patient's symptoms. So what what is the etiology of MS? Um, as of now, it's really unknown, but uh, most people think that it's probably autoimmune. Um, it may be related to environmental factors, a genetic predisposition, uh, I'm sorry, genetic predisposition, or possibly due to some sort of virus, uh, viral infection. Um, the pathology, uh, the plaques are associated with lymphocyte and macrophage infiltration. Um, then you get this astrocyte proliferation and finally gliosis. The oligodendrocytes are destroyed and then you get plaques that start around the venules and grow along the vessels. Um, relapsing, remitting versus progressive multiple sclerosis. Um, relapsing, remitting becomes secondary progressive in about 50% of patients at 10 years, so these patients do progress, unfortunately. Um, prognosis, usually after about 15 years, about half the patients diagnosed will be walking with some sort of device, usually a cane. Um, some people will be uh, bound uh, in a wheelchair, um, and 2% uh, will have died. Um, and that Punicello actually died from sequela multiple sclerosis, sadly. Um, how do we treat multiple sclerosis? That's the thing. You get it? OK, I've got it. What do I do about it? Um, for exacerbations, they use corticosteroids, which is the mainstay. Um, but to slow the progression and reduce relapses, uh, a number of medications uh, have been used. Um, immunomodulatory drugs such as interferon B1, uh, B1A and B1B, uh, copolymer 1, what it does, it mimics myelin basic protein. Um, and then you get the other medications uh, such as cyclosporins and methotrexate. Um, what do they use for relapsing remitting? Um, as you can see there, these different types of medications, um, some are injectable that can uh, reduce the number of immune cells present in the body. Some are thought to stop the immune cells. Um, one, uh, minocycline is an oral antibiotic, which is used to treat bacterial infection, infections, which they think can help to prevent inflammation. Um, again, relapsing, remitting uh, medications, um, 
some are thought to help stop immune cells, um, some are antiretroviral, and some are infusion, which help to uh, target cells in the immune system. Um, progressive MS treatment, again, um, infusion targeting cells in the immune system, and the simvastatin, um, what it's shown to do, it's shown to have some neuroprotective properties that, uh, that they're using. Um, you might have heard of chronic uh, cerebrospinal venous insufficiency, or CCVI. Um, this is a theory. Um, it's characterized by poor removal of oxygen-depleted blood from the central nervous system. Um, this is thought to be caused by constriction of the blood vessels in the brain and neck, which affects brain blood flow and drainage. Um, there was a study published in 2009 that looked at the prevalence of this uh, CCVI in people with multiple sclerosis and found that uh, CCVI was present in 90% of people with multiple sclerosis, but it's still not clear, though, if there's a link. Um, they have a procedure uh, that um, I don't see used much anymore, um, at least where I'm at, is a surgical procedure that inflates the balloon in the veins, and what the aim is to do is to improve the, the drainage of blood out of the brain. Um, they did a study in the UK at the National Institutes of Health, uh, basically, they're saying that um, it should, the procedure should only be used in the context of research. Uh, the FDA uh, did um, a paper in May of 2012 that said there was lack of clear evidence for this type of treatment, um, and it, it really hasn't been established that you should be doing this for your multiple sclerosis patients. What else do they use other than medication? <clears throat> Um, sometimes they use vitamin D. Okay, as you well know, um, if you remember back to medical school, um, MS is more common in areas that are further away from the equator, um, where there's less sunshine, suggests that there's a relationship between vitamin D and the risk of developing multiple sclerosis. Again, for those of you here in the, in the Midwest or in the Northeast, uh, Michigan, huge amount of people with multiple sclerosis, Pennsylvania, where I came from, obviously in Minnesota, Illinois, etc. Um, so if you're born down close to the equator, you're going to have less of a chance. Strangely, though, if you were born here uh, in those areas like Pennsylvania, Michigan, and lived here most of your life and moved down toward uh, the equator, you still have the same chance. So it's obviously where you're born and where you live most of your life. Um, but it, again, it's not clear whether vitamin D is playing a role in managing uh, multiple sclerosis, but I still take my vitamin D and get as much sun as I can. Um, sources of vitamin D are fish, uh, salmon, and sardines. Um, you can get cereals and eggs, um, but it's still impossible to get all of your vitamin D through diet. So what you need to do is you need to go out into the sun. Um, without sunscreen, about 15 minutes of sunlight a day on bare skin. You don't need a lot. You can stick your arm out the car when you're driving to, uh, to work, and that should, that should do it. Um, so again, you should have a few minutes of sun exposure um, without sunscreen. Um, again, treatment, low dose uh, naltrexone, what does it do? It triggers uh, uh, prolonged upregulation of endorphins, which may have an anti-inflammatory effect. Um, they may be able to reduce injury to the nervous system by decreasing free radicals and excitotoxins. So um, the American Academy of Neurology in Chicago in 2008 um, showed a significant reduction in spasticity uh, was measured at the end of trial when they used this. Um, so it was published in the September issue of the journal Multiple Sclerosis in 2008. Uh, Tysabri, I don't know if uh, any of you are familiar with this medication, um, but what is it? It's a monoclonal antibody. It's designed to uh, decrease the movement of potentially damaging immune cells from the bloodstream across the blood-brain barrier and into the brain and spinal cord. Um, it's treatment of patients with relapsing MS. To to delay the accumulation of physical disability and reduce the frequency of exacerbations. However, this is a big however, it increases the risk of PML. Um, remember, um, if PML is, um, some, if you get PML, basically it's, it's, it's a death sentence. Um, it's a recommended, so it's high salary, you have to be very regulated. Um, it's, regula it's recommended for patients who have had an inadequate response to or cannot tolerate any of the alternative uh, MS therapy. The people who were on it swear by it, um, but I unfortunately have seen people who have been on it who have died. Um, so if you test positive for the uh, JC virus, <clears throat> it is shown to be a risk factor for PML. <clears throat> and only people who have been exposed to 
to the JC virus are at risk for PML. Um, so known risk factors for the development of the PML for, uh, for people who are on Tysabri are those that are on Tysabri for a long period of time, which is usually over two years. So they're trying not to keep you on it for too long. Um, anybody who has had treatment with immunosuppressant medications such as the uh, methotrexate, um, cyclophosphamide, et cetera, um, in the presence of uh, JC antibodies, uh, patients who are anti-JC antibody positive have a much higher risk of PML. So that's a big thing. So we see that a lot with the clinics where I work. Um, and I've called a couple of people with, um, with progressive MS on Tysabri and they automatically stop, stop treatment. So this is a patient with MS and they looked sort of typical MS and then they were put on Tysabri. And you can see this diffuse flare hyperintensity in the frontal lobe. It can, you can see it everywhere. I've seen it frontal lobes, um, anterior, posterior. I've seen it everywhere. It, it can be very, very bad. Um, this is a T2 of the patient um, who is uh, on Tysabri who has got PML. And you can see it on the left. It's just progressed significantly. Um, I can't remember if this patient uh, died or not. I can't remember. Um, okay, so you might have heard of a type of MS um, uh, with someone who has got radiologically isolated syndrome. Um, so what really is it? it they are T2 lesions with features that are highly suggestive of a multiple sclerosis in a patient that is asymptomatic. So um, they come in, they don't have any symptoms, you do a, uh, an MR, They've got the characteristic lesions in a characteristic location, but they're asymptomatic. Um, so that's very important that you convey that information to the neurologist or even the, uh, the, the physician that ordered the test because you can get progression in about 60% of these patients. So that's huge. <clears throat> the hyperintensity 2 lesion load is actually going to be higher in the secondary progressive, more than benign, uh, relapsing, remitting, and even primary progressive. Um, but here's the thing, though, the magnitude of correlation between the amount of lesions and disability is low. Just because you have a lot of lesions does not necessarily mean you've got disability and vice versa. Um, so conventional MR measures have shown to convey a poor prognostic information about clinical progression. So what do we do? Well, um, there is a few different techniques and uh, types of uh, contrast agents. Uh, one of the contract, uh, contrast agents, which I haven't used, are these, um, they're composed of iron particles, which are ultra small particles of iron oxide, USPIOs. Um, what they are, they're taken up by the cells in the monocyte macrophage system. The enhancement will, will reflect the cellular infiltration and may complement the gadolinium. Um, and this iron uptake of the USPIO, uh, it may precede gadolinium enhancement by weeks. So just because it's not enhancing doesn't necessarily mean it's not active. Um, they have a new technique called double inversion recovery. Um, it helps to identify the cortical base lesions, um, which really hard to see on conventional techniques. Um, the areas where they're using the double inversion recovery, they've seen a over 500% increase in sensitivity when compared to a typical T2 spin echo imaging. And I'll show you that in a little bit. Um, the drawback is there's a uh, signal to noise look ratio and it's prone to artifacts, sadly. Um, but you can see here, um, you have your um, uh, T2 uh, kind of diffusion, you got your flare here, and then you have your double inversion recovery where you really don't see the lesion there unless you're looking at the double inversion recovery. And on the bottom you can see that they blew it up and you can really see the difference. Um, so that may be something you're going to be seeing in your practice. As far as looking at brains, one of the things that I comment on is the volume. Is there volume loss or not? And if you've looked at multiple sclerosis and people who've got chronic MS, you'll know that they have um, volume loss or atrophy. Um, they do see atrophy and gray matter in the early stages of the disease. Um, that's associated with clinical disability and cognitive deterioration, which will worsen over time. Um, the amount of atrophy will increase as the disease stage um, increases. Um, so you'll see a uh, normal rate, three times the normal rate uh, in patients with clinically isolated syndrome um, converting to the relapsing remitting and even 14 times the normal rates of atrophy in patients with solitary progressive. So as, as MS worsens, you're going to see much more atrophy. 
Um, these are the areas um, where you will see the atrophy. Um, I won't uh, go into this, but um, you could actually, if someone has benign multiple sclerosis, you can see just a, a, a gray volume, I'm sorry, gray matter volume loss in the subcortical and frontal parietal locations, as opposed to, say, someone with pediatric multiple sclerosis, just atrophy in the thalamus only. Um, so another type of technique is what's called uh, MTR or magnetic transfer ratio. Um, what is it? It's a gradient echo or spin echo sequence, um, and they use uh, an off-residence uh, saturation pulse. It allows a cal the calculation of an index called the MTR. What is MTR? Um, a reduction of this indicates a diminished capacity of the protons that are bound to the brain tissue matrix um, to exchange the magnetization with, uh, with the surrounding free water. The index uh, provides an estimate of the extent of tissue disruption. So that's what you're looking for. This index gives you an extent of tissue disruption. Um, so they've done a bunch of serial studies, and they've shown that you've got this dramatic changes in normal appearing white matter in days to weeks uh, prior to formation of enhancing lesions. So remember I was telling you before, where someone may come in and they may have um, a lesion, but they're not clinically um, presenting that way. Um, they, a couple years before, if you've done this uh, MTR, they may have started to show um, uh, these changes even even before seeing the standard MR. So that's that could be groundbreaking in the future. Um, you know, this, uh, diffuse disease burden in normal appearing white matter and gray matter correlates better with the clinical manifestation of MS than does uh, the amount of T2 lesion burden. There we go. Um, so again, the MTR, so what does it look like? Um, this is what MTR looks like. Uh, we don't use it at our institution, um, but you may run across it where you're at. Um, I, I won't uh, go too much into MTR. Um, MR spectroscopy, um, you might have uh, used those or heard about them. Um, acute MS lesions show an increase in choline and lactate. Um, what they do, it reflects the release of the membrane phospholipids, and what that is, it's um, metabolism of inflammatory cells. Um, conversely, you'll see a decrease in the NAA, which indic indicates neuraxonal loss or dysfunction. Um, eventually, the levels gradually return to normal. Um, your choline and lipid levels are returned to normal after several months. Um, however, your NAA levels may return may remain reduced or show some partial recovery uh, be, uh, beginning uh, just after the acute phase. Um, iron deposition in um, patients with MS, um, they're found in the basal ganglia, thalamus, uh, dentate nucleus, and cortex of MS patients. Um, ways you can find iron deposition is if you use a susceptibility weighted or T2 star or hemoflash sequence. Um, that's been used to assess, uh, to assess the iron concentration and to evaluate uh, cerebral oxygenation, which, again, if you remember, um, with that chronic cerebral spinal venous insufficiency, um, they think that iron deposition um, may be related to uh, anomalies of venous outflow, um, but they're not sure about that yet. Uh, Perfusion-weighted MR, uh, it evaluates the abnormalities of uh, regional cerebral uh, hemodynamics. Um, it can demonstrate vascular occlusive changes, which are characterized by the small vein and capillary thromboses. Um, and you may have uh, hyalinization um, and intravascular fibrin deposition within the, the wall of the vein. Uh, perfusion weighted MR, your uh, enhancing lesions will show an increased perfusion, um, while the chronic MS will show a decreased perfusion. And this does correlate with the clinical disability and the neuropsychological uh, impairment. Um, functional MR, some of you might have uh, seen that or used it. Um, it uses echoplanar sequences during a performance of different tasks the patient is uh, conscious. Um, and you'll see abnormal activation patterns. Um, um, and it measures the overall disease burden. So what it does is suggest some stage of disease, functional re reorganization of the brain uh, might be occurring. Um, so initially what happened is you'll see uh, recruitment of normal areas early in the in the disease, and then you'll wind up seeing bilateral activation of these areas, followed by widespread recruitment as the brain, um, as the myelin uh, continues to break down. Um, as the disease progresses, you're going to have a maladaptive pattern, 
um, which again I won't get too much into. Um, I can only suggest that if you get a chance to look at a functional MR um, to go ahead and do it, uh, that may be the future of, um, of multiple sclerosis. Um, and this is uh, someone that's going under a, a functional MR. Again, um, I won't uh, go too, too in-depth just to tell you that they're having some maladaptive um, um, recruitment. Um, you can go uh, advanced imaging techniques. You can use this uh, this, this uh, link. It's uh, Indian uh, radiology, which um, they're they're doing uh, research into this as well. Um, DWI diffusion. Um, what does it do? It highlights the brain microstructure damage that's not visible. Um, it's based on the uh, measurement of motion of water molecules, as you well know. Um, Usually, free water moves equally in all directions in an isotropic fashion. Um, when it's restricted inside or by tissues, you get this preferential directions are taken and movement consequently becomes anisotropic. Um, water mobility in the brain is markedly reduced in compact tissues such as white matter, and it's reduced to a lesser extent in gray matter, and it's obviously almost free in CSF. Um, that leads me into diffusion tensor imaging, which you may have heard about. Um, what does it do? It uses echoplanar sequences and diffusion um, weighted and magnetic field gradients, which are applied in different directions, which will enable the random diffusion motion of water uh, molecules to be measured. And what it does is you measure metrics such as mean diffusivity as for the MD and the fractional anisotropy, which is the, F, uh, the FA. And what that is, it's sensitive to the size and geometry of the white matter spaces. Um, correlates uh, pretty well with postmortem and demyelination uh, and axonal loss. Um, and you'll see an increase in uh, diffusion and a decrease in the functional anisotropy in people with, um, with MS. So basically what this does is an increase in, in diffusion, it may precede lesion formation. So you may see this even before you can see it in normal MS. Um, if you look at the gray matter, um, average gray matter, uh, diffusion, it correlates with the degree of cognitive impairment and actually is a predictor of accumulation of disability over five, uh, five years. Um, so again, something that you may be seeing. Um, even people who have benign MS, um, you're going to see uh, DTI uh, lesion issues. Um, what you do for uh, DTI is uh, diffusion images are acquired in uh, three gradient sequences. Um, uh, there's a matrix that's acquired from at least six gradient directions and characterizes the 3D movement. Um, it can be represented, uh, you can put an ellipsoid on those, on those areas, and what you're looking for is the longest axis, uh, it reflects the diffusion which is parallel to the fibers, or as I was telling you that diffusion, the axial diffusivity which measures the um, integrity of your axons. Um, the two shorter axes which are perpendicular to the fibers um, is your radial diffusivity or RD and that measures your myelin integrity. Is your myelin in, you know, intact or not? So that's what the RD look, looks at and this is math which I won't bore you with which I don't look at. Something for your physicists to do. So what the DTI does is the metrics discriminate between the axonal damage which remember is your axonal diffusivity and your demyelinating damage, which is your AD. So that's what it looks at. Um, in white matter tract and MS patients, um, your diffusivity is increased owing to the loss of myelin, um, and your axial diffusivity is either increased or decreased. I know that sounds kind of strange, but it is in comparison to healthier subjects. And it may be decreased in consequence to the axonal loss, but it may be increased uh, because it may be a representation of an attempt of the brain to maintain function, uh, functionality in the presence of your white matter loss. Uh, the mean diffusivity is a mathematical combination, again, of the three vectors, which you don't have to worry about um, determining. It measures overall water motion. Uh, the fractional anisotropy, it reflects the prevalence of diffusion along one direction. And again, it's the highest in compact uh, white matter areas. Uh, decreases in gray matter and approaches zero in CSF. I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, the anisotropy is correlated to axonal density and myelin content, and again, the diffusion is correlated to the amount of myelin. Um, they both have been uh, shown to be affected mainly by the myelin content, 
and to a lesser extent of the axonal uh, density. Um, mean diffusivity is influenced by free space, uh, which pretty much uh, goes back to the myelin loss, while the FA is more sensitive to the integrity of the white matter. So it just looks, is the white matter intact or not? Um, it's not real specific. Um, and again, you can have many uh, disease processes, such as edema um, or inflammation, that can show the same thing. Um, it's just another way of studying diffusion images based on the reconstruction of large fiber bundles. Um, and can be used to analyze the displacement of fibers as well as to detect for Wallerian degeneration, which is a decrease of your white matter tract downstream. Um, obviously, it does have some limitations, as most things do. Um, they're, it's difficult to find the principal direction when there are many crossing fibers. That can be an issue. It does have low signal-to-noise ratio. There's poor spatial resolution. It cannot detect small fibers, um, so you have to do a big, uh, a big group of them. Um, and if you have you know, distorted brain uh, from um, uh, any kind of tissue loss or whatever, um, you have to have a prior knowledge of the anatomic structures in order to use this. So this is just a pretty 3D picture of what it looks like. Um, usually we look at uh, fibers going AP, uh, fibers going um, uh, right to left, and fibers going up and down the cortical spinal tract. Um, those are the ones that are in blue there. Those are the most important ones that I like to use. Um, and those are the ones that tend to look uh, for Wallerian degeneration, which is what I most um, important, uh, what I think is the most important. Um, in MS patients, you get these widespread DTI abnormalities, uh, which um, consist of the increased MD, again, which reflects myelin loss, and you have a decrease in functional anisotropy, which is, which is reflecting um, your white matter integrity, which is lost. Um, and they have been detected in even people with MS with normal appearing white matter. So that's pretty huge. Um, degree of damage varies according to the severity of pathology. And even at an early age, you can have DTI detectable damage, which uh, increasingly gets worse um, as the disease uh, worsens. Um, in comparison to that clinically isolated syndrome, the relapse and remitting, benign, secondary progressive, uh, patients exhibit more pronounced white matter diffusion. Um, the greater the increase in diffusion um, uh, in, in people with uh, secondary progressive, uh, it may be due to a combination of the axonal loss and destruction. Um, multiple sclerosis also affects the gray matter. Um, you can get some microscopic damage, which uh, can be detectable even in the absence of uh, macroscopic disease. Um, so again, you can get these anatomic changes, which are usually visible in the deep and cortical gray matter in most multiple sclerotic phenotypes. Um, adults with benign MS have uh, shown changes in DTI with an increase uh, in MD, remember, which is uh, reflecting myelin loss. And basically what that does is suggest demyelination um, is prevailing over axonal damage uh, when the disease is clinically less severe. So it's a demyelinating disease. It makes sense. Um, in the spinal cord, um, we can use it, uh, reduction in FA and increase in MD were observed even in patients with normal appearing white matter. And again, it points to widespread pathologic involvement in the spine regardless of the presence of T2 lesions. So again, even if you don't have them, you can still see it. Um, in tissues uh, with MS, um, you'll see a decrease in M, uh, FA and MD, which is increased. Um, the lesions in the black holes, remember I told you, which you have a lot of tissue loss, um, it's characterized by severe tissue injury, which is associated with the most severe diffusion alterations. It just makes sense if you think about it. Uh, metrics and clinical disability. Um, the non-conventional techniques may detect microstructure changes and correlate uh, with the clinical impairment more closely than the uh, MRI techniques that we're using currently. Uh, the diffusion abnormalities uh, they're more pronounced in patients with a long disease duration and severe neurological disability. So you may be seeing this. Um, correlations between a DTI uh, measures and clinical scales, um, it, it's more apparent than microstructural damage. Um, if you look at the uh, globes, ocular motor function impairment was associated with functional DTI alteration. Um, so even in the optic nerves, you can see it as well. Um, tractography DTI demonstrates correlation between the alterations of the white matter tracts and the specific cortical spinal tracts, as I was telling you. 
um, in the corpus callosum and motor, dis uh, motor disability. Um, so it, it can reveal the tract injury um, responsible for the cognitive dysfunction in the multiple sclerosis patients that we normally see. Um, these focal abnormalities, specifically corpus callosum, which again, if you look at the Dawson's fingers, they've been related to uh, cal uh, calculation, sequential learning, memory difficulties. Um, so a bunch of studies have detected uh, correlation with cognitive impairment and the DTI abnormalities of, of the tract. So that's important. Um, there's a strong correlation between DTI measures and spinal cord and disability. Um, so again, you may be seeing this uh, more uh, in your practice. So in conclusion, the dif uh, diffusion abnormalities and the normal appearing white matter um, have been demonstrated in all the phenotypes of, of MS with uh, microstructural changes being detected earlier, uh, even in the early onset of MS. The diffusion metrics of the DTI appear to, um, to differ according to MS phenotype and within different kinds of lesions. Um, and the different uh, MS phenotypes display different diffusivity patterns. Diffusion measures may represent useful markers uh, to differentiate between the MS uh, phenotype. Um, due to the high sensitivity of detecting structural tissue abnormalities, um, DTI measures, uh, it has been pro pro proposed um, as a uh, prognostic marker of disease um, rather than just relying on uh, standard MRI uh, techniques and further studies are warranted um, in this field to achieve more results. So I know the end there was a little dry. I apologize. And I apologize for the little hiccup I had uh, about three quarters of the way through. So, uh, well, thank you very much, Dr. Bianca Seven, and thank you everyone for your attention and patience. And like I had mentioned, our next lecture will be on November 11th. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you.